Welcome and thank you for joining the FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Note that all audio connections are muted at this time. You are able to submit questions throughout the presentation by selecting all panelists from the drop down menu in the chat panel and entering your question in the message box provided. If you require technical assistance, send a chat to the event producer. And with that, I'll turn the conference over to David Ferriero. David? Good morning, um, and welcome to the National Archives Records and, and Records Administration in our very first virtual meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I usually welcome you to my building. Today, I welcome you to my office. Today, as we distance ourselves from the, the downtown building where this committee usually meets, I'm reminded of one of the four monumental statues placed at either side of the, of the two entrances of the building. One of the statues, an allegorical figure designed by Robert Aiken and actually chiseled by the Piccarelli brothers who did this, the great lions at the New York Public Library depicts a young woman with an open book gazing into the future above an inscription that reads what is past is prologue. This quote, as you know from Shakespeare's The Tempest, speaks particularly to the National Archives records being used to learn from the past in creating a better future. But the quote is also a reminder of the very important work that goes on every day by FOIA requesters and professionals across the government who work to ensure that records of the public interest are released to the extent that they can be to inform citizens, hold those in power accountable, and to help document these extraordinary times. Some of the records released under FOIA during these times will become an important part of our nation's history. The public health emergency caused by the coronavirus pandemic is putting unprecedented stress on agency FOIA operations, processes, and staff. FOIA staff and requesters alike face uncertainty and anxiety in staying healthy and educating children from home while continuing to ensure that the FOIA process works. This is not easy for any of us. I understand that since the abrupt shift to full-time telework just more than a week after the FOIA Advisory Committee's March 5th meeting, a small working group has met weekly to write the outline of a final report while two of the three subcommittees have met to fine-tune recommendations to be discussed and voted on here today. In the face of such uncertainty, I applaud your continued work, quick shift to virtual work, and commitment to completing the work of this third term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I look forward to receiving your final recommendations at the June 4th meeting, the final for this term. I thank the entire FOIA community for all you do in these challenging days. Like the statue of the young woman gazing into the future, I also look to the future and the time when we can meet together again in our downtown building. Take care, safe, be well. I will turn the meeting now back to Alina Simo. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, David, we really appreciate it. Uh, as the Director of the Office of Government Information Services and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our very first ever virtual meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee and also our eighth meeting of the 2018-2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I hope everyone who's joining us today has been staying healthy, safe, and well. During these unprecedented times, the National Archives has temporarily closed nearly all of its facilities. Um, certain NARA facilities do remain open with reduced operations, but NARA has canceled all of its public meetings at least until the end of June. So we will not be gathering in the Gallon Theater as we have for the past several years as we finish off the current term of uh, our committee. I know that these have been challenging times as we all navigate changes to our personal and professional lives, but as we navigate through the COVID-19 pandemic and work through these atypical circumstances, it is more important than ever to recognize the value of this committee. I want to thank all of you for your service and for your passion and commitment to developing consensus recommendations for improving way administration. I remain grateful for everything this committee has accomplished despite these challenging times. 
I especially would like to recognize all the hard work of the committee's designated federal officer, Kirsten Mitchell. Give her a round of applause. She's done a great job. Uh, and we are all, of, uh, all in this together. Uh, we're also in the home stretch, so that's the good news. Uh, today, I will uh, go ahead and cover some housekeeping rules, review our general agenda, and along the way, set some expectations for today's meeting. Uh, as David pointed out earlier, we are ambitiously trying this new mode of holding uh, this committee meeting and our next one as well, uh, virtually. So the virtual environment in lieu of the in-person medium has many advantages, including much shorter commutes for all of us and very casual Fridays. Um, the disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we will not be able to see you raising your hand or eagerly leaning forward, ready to make a comment or ask a question. Um, I have asked all of you to turn on your cameras so I could try to see you throughout the meeting. Um, and I will be doing my best to monitor your verbal cues during the webcast. Uh, but I do want to remind everyone we will need to be respectful of one another and try not to speak over one another, although I realize that may be inevitable at times. Uh, I also want to encourage all committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop-down menu in the chat function if they would like to speak. Uh, you can also chat me directly. But I uh, also want to point out to everyone that in the spirit of complying with the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, please keep any communications in the chat function to only housekeeping and procedural matters. No substantive comment should be made in that chat function as they will not be recorded in the transcript of the meeting. Any questions so far? No? Okay. If you need to take a break, please do not disconnect from either the audio or video of the web event. Put your phone on mute and close your camera and join us again as soon as you can. Uh, just a reminder again, as I remind everyone at every meeting, please identify yourself by name and affiliation each time you speak. This will help us down the road with the, both the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. As most of you know, the Federal uh, FOIA Advisory Committee, which reports to the Archivist of the United States, provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public the opportunity to provide their feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. We encourage public comments, suggestions, and feedback that you may submit at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov. Meeting materials are available on the committee's webpage. Uh, we will upload a transcript and video of today's meeting as soon as it is available to the committee's webpage. Information about the committee, including members' biographies and committee documents, are available on the 2018-2020 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. I invite everyone to visit the site, and that way we can dispense with introductions today. Nearly all of our members are participating today. Bradley White from Department of Homeland Security is unable to join us today. And Sarah Kotler from the Food and Drug Administration will need to depart approximately halfway through our meeting. Everyone else, please hang in there. To promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, we post committee updates and information to our website, blog, and on Twitter at FOIA underscore ombud. Stay up to date on the latest OGIS and FOIA Advisory Committee news, activities, and events by following us on social media. We have posted the agenda for today's meeting on the FOIA Advisory Committee's website. And our goal as a committee today is to propose, discuss, and vote on recommendations from the Vision Subcommittee and the Time Volume Subcommittee. We have not allocated specific time frames for each subcommittee. We thought we would see how the meeting progresses and flows. But I do promise that uh, although there is no break on the agenda, we will take a 15-minute break at a logical point. And if uh, anyone wants to prompt me in that direction, please feel free to do that. Um, and although we have an ambitious agenda today, we will ensure there is time at the end of the meeting for public comments, and we look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. Jesse Kratz, the National Archives historian, who is assisting OGIS with its many administrative responsibilities for the FOIA Advisory Committee. We'll be monitoring the chat function during the webinar, 
and I will ask her to read out loud any questions or comments during the public comment period at the end of our meeting. I also hope to have sufficient time during today's meeting for us to discuss the final report outline item on our agenda. Uh, thank you very much to the following working group members who have been hard at work uh, already, Jason R. Barron, Abby Moshein, Sean Moulton, and Patricia West. Since our last meeting on March 5th, this small but mighty group has been hard at work drafting a report of those recommendations that the committee has already passed. We will be able to make additional headway once the vision and time volume subcommittee's recommendations are voted on today. The goal is to circulate a final draft well in advance of our final meeting on June 4th and use our last meeting to iron out any outstanding issues and take any final votes if needed. Uh, next, I would like to, uh, first before I move on, any questions from any of our committee members? No, I'm seeing lots of head shaking, no, great, okay. Uh, I would like to try to approve the meeting minutes from our March 5th meeting. Kirsten circulated those uh, earlier this morning. We apologize for the last minute circulation. We were just trying to finalize things. Um, did everyone on the committee receive the minutes from the March 5th meeting? Great, I'm seeing a lot of nods, yes, love that. Um, I want to note that the transcript from the March 5th meeting did not reflect the fact that I abstained from voting on certain recommendations that were passed by the committee. Uh, that is consistent with the position I took during the second term of the committee as well. In order to avoid a potential conflict of interest, I uh, have and will continue to specifically abstain on any specific recommendations that relate to uh, the Office of Government Information Services and or NARA. Um, and there will be several other recommendations that are coming into play today that involve the Chief Lawyer Officer Council. Since I am co-chair of that council, I also plan to abstain from those. Um, I have added that statement in the minutes for the relevant recommendations that we considered and voted on during our March 5th meeting. Um, Bobby Talabian has uh, across the board abstained, so his job is so much easier. I see that in Washington too. So later today, Kirsten and I would uh, like to certify the minutes to be accurate and complete, which we are required to do within 90 days. So we're actually well ahead of that 90-day uh, requirement of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Uh, but if I uh, if I don't see anyone objecting, uh, do I have a motion to approve the March 5th meetings in our current? Can, can I make a comment first? Right, this is James Stoker. Yes, please, James. So I appreciate all the work that goes into the, the minutes. I know it's very difficult to put these things together, but I, I did just want to draw a committee's attention to one particular point in regards to the time volume recommendation number four at the end. Uh, so the minutes note that Mr. Stoker moved to vote on the amended version of the recommendation four, which was seconded and passed with Mr. Talibian abstaining. It's unclear whether committee members believe they were voting on the recommendation in spirit. Um, so, my comment on this is that it's, it is very important to accurately record what we are voting on. And I was under the impression that we had actually voted to pass the resolution. Now, I, I think we can come back to this today and vote on it and uh, not worry about what happened in the last meeting because we can have another vote today. But I just want us to, to, to be very clear before we vote today on whether or not we are voting for uh, recommendations in spirit or to actually pass. Uh, so I, I just wanted to make that comment so that we are aware of this issue going forward and that we're very clear on what we're voting on. Now, James, thank you very much for that comment. Yes, we uh, at Kirsten and uh, Jesse and I spent a while going back and forth trying to figure out exactly what happened. We tried to look at the transcript carefully. We also listened to the YouTube video. Um, and we agree there's definitely uncertainty. I see Kirsten nodding her head as well. Um, and I, I definitely agree with you. It's very important today that we ensure that we're voting on each recommendation, not in spirit, but as the language that we're proposing. To that end, we have actually uh, provided and are sharing with everyone, attendees and committee members, the slides that have each of the recommendations as written. And I definitely wanted to encourage you in particular, James, to make sure that you go back over time volume recommendation number four 
and make sure that we vote on exactly the language that you want. So I think it's a very fair point. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion then to try to approve the uh, March 5th meetings in their, in their current form? I motion. Thank you, Jane. Uh, no second required, but do I have a second? Usually I have Tom seconding, but he's silent today. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, I think I believe I believe that was you. Um, all present, uh, please uh, indicate if you're in favor by saying aye. 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 Uh, anyone, is, an, is anyone a nay on the minutes? Okay. Is anyone abstaining from the minutes? Bob, you're not abstaining on the minutes, correct? No, correct. Okay, just want to double check. All right, so it looks like we passed them unanimously. Uh, we are we have approved the minutes, and we will get those posted um, as soon as possible after today's meeting. I do want to just briefly review the voting procedures in our last meeting. We did include them physically in your individual folders. Um, obviously, we weren't able to provide you folders today. Uh, but um, any member of the committee can move to vote on a recommendation. The motion does not need to be seconded, although it seems like we've been doing that, so happy to entertain that. Uh, the vote can pass by unanimous decision, which is when every voting member accepts abstentions, is in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. A general consensus, which is when at least two-thirds of the total votes cast are in favor of or opposed to a particular motion and general majority, which is when a majority of the total votes cast are in favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. In the event of a tie, we will, we will reopen discussion and the committee will continue to vote until there is a majority. If you are in favor of recommendation, say, I will ask you to say aye. If you are against a recommendation, I, I will ask you to say nay. If you do not wish to vote, uh, say abstain. Uh, in this current virtual environment, uh, we will try to take a voice vote, uh, so we'll continue that practice. Um, Kirsten and I will make sure that we pay particular attention to any nays and abstentions to make sure we have the record clear. Um, and Kirsten, as our DFO, will record and announce the results of the vote. I'm not sure we announced them last time, but we can certainly do that this time. So today, to begin our discussion, I'm going to ask each of the subcommittees to present their recommendations. Uh, and I, as I understand it, uh, from each of the two subcommittees, we're going to have individual subcommittee members present on individual recommendations. So hopefully I'll remember to turn it over to each correct uh, member. Uh, folks should feel free to comment, uh, ask questions, discuss. Um, I will open up the floor uh, after the recommendation has been presented for that comment period. Uh, feedback, also welcomed. After comments, questions, discussion, and feedback, I will ask whether the committee is prepared to take a vote on each of those recommendations, and we will vote on each one. And hopefully the record will be crystal clear this time uh, on what we're voting on. So before I go on uh, to the substance of the meeting, I want to make sure that committee members are all good. Anyone have any questions? I got a thumbs up from Tom. Thank you. All right. Looks like we're good. So I promised last time the Vision Subcommittee would go first today since I took away any of their air time last time and I again apologize for that. We did run out of time. So um, at this time, I would normally turn it over to Chris and Joan. Do you, either one of you, make, want to make any preliminary introductory remarks? No, I don't have anything to say up front. Thank you, though. Okay. All right. Thanks, Joan. No, Lena, same, same for me. Thank you. Okay. So I believe, uh, Kirsten, if you could flip us over on the PowerPoint presentation to vision recommendation number one. And I believe Michael Morrissey is going to present on that recommendation. Hi. Yes. Am I coming through? Yep. Hey. 
Um, yeah, so for vision recommendation one, uh, thank you, first of all, a lot of people had some really great feedback as we were kind of crafting this um, in terms of thinking through what would be most effective. Um, and uh, the, the recommendation comes down to the archivist of the United States requests that the Chief FOIA Officers Council create a committee for cross-agency collaboration and innovation to research and propose a cross-agency grant program and other revenue resources for FOIA programs review and promote initiatives for clear career directories for FOIA professionals, building on the government information specialist job series, and in coordination with existing agency efforts, and explore and recommend models to align agency resources with transparency commitment. As we are thinking through sort of what, what do we need to do to kind of better align um, the agencies that resources have with the, the jobs that they're charged to do, we wanted to find a way to kind of let agencies sort of highlight their needs and make sure that FOIA officers, FOIA processors, FOIA offices feel supported um, both in the short term with resources and innovation grants, um, but also in the long term to make sure that this, they feel that this is a field where they can really build a career. Um, and I think there's been some really wonderful efforts in that area uh, over the last few years, both by individual agencies, um, as well as support groups, as well as sort of uh, the, the government information specialist job series. Um, but we really want to sort of give uh, the FOIA processing community sort of an avenue to kind of say, hey, here's what we're seeing is working and not working within our career field and how agencies can better support long-term uh, professional growth and stability for that field. Um, and then I think one of the more uh, more discussion around the proposal to try to research and propose a cost agency grant program. Um, anything that involves spending sort of new money is, is always a, a tricky proposition. Um, but one thing that was really important to me was sort of as we move forward with future legislative improvements um, and sort of, uh, you know, changes to the FOIA programs, really having suggestions on the table, really sort of finding ways to let FOIA offices kind of highlight pain points and opportunities uh, for future investment, I think is really important. I think um, with FOIA reforms, with FOIA uh, changes in, in legislative efforts, um, we've seen a lot about what the requester community wants, and we haven't seen enough um, in terms of what is needed to actually support that work as well as support the workloads that, that FOIA offices currently struggle with. And so um, this seemed like a good sort of way to kind of uh, give a voice to sort of FOIA offices and let them say, hey, here's what we need, uh, here's areas where we could use funding, uh, and here's experimental programs that we would like a chance to kind of uh, work on. And so, um, you know, it's, it's always challenging for agencies to kind of lobby on their own behalf, uh, but I think finding ways to kind of let good ideas come out and, and have specific grant proposals that um, will be in need of funding, but I think that's a, at least a starting point for future conversations. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I think the applause was muted. Yes, the applause was muted. Uh, I want to open up the floor to questions, comments, thoughts, reactions. As a reminder, uh, you can submit a question or comment by sending a chat to all panelists, or if you want to make your comment over the phone, you may dial pound two to indicate that you wish to ask a question. One Hi, thing I would just Patricia West. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I, I like this recommendation a lot, and I think that um, we've seen success from uh, prior um, subcommittees that were created by the Chief FOIA Officer Council in the in the Technology Committee, and we've seen how much. Um, that's assisted uh, us. Um, so I, th I think this is going to be a very uh, interesting committee, and, and I look forward to 
to uh, their findings. Michael, did you want to add something? I thought I heard you speak up earlier. Yeah, sorry, this is Michael Morrissey from Muckrock again, uh, and apologies for not introducing myself last time, but uh, I do just want to note that I do want to fill out the way I did get some really good feedback the last few days about um, more context and background that can be included below the actual recommendation itself, so I'm hoping to kind of have uh, a beefier version of that in the coming days. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for your comment. Really appreciate that. Anyone else want to chime in? All quiet. Ryan, I see you leaning in. Do you want to say, any, say anything, or you're just looking interested? Yeah, no, thank you, Alina. Uh, then this is Ryan. So, no, I, I, I really like this uh, recommendation. Um, I think um, particularly in uh, highlighting and promoting best practices for uh, and uh, improving career tra tra trajectories for FOIA professionals. Um, I know there are some agencies that do it very well. Others can do a better job, and I think I, I really like this recommendation. So I, I don't have anything to improve it, though. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, anyone else? So, Lizette and Sarah, I just want you to know I can't see you on camera, nor can I see Patricia. So, if you guys are leaning forward like Ryan was just a second ago, I am not able to see you. So, don't be afraid to speak up. No, I, I appreciate that. My uh, camera is not enabled on my computer, so you will not see me. Um, but I okay. probably am slouching as well. Um, so. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is Patricia. Uh, um, you can't see me at all, is that right? Correct. Oh, okay. Um, I, I will try and figure that out. Um, sorry about that. No, no problem. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to comment on uh, vision recommendation number one? Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, do you all think that we're ready to vote on it? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the yes. Um, does anyone uh, want to make a motion? No. Well, I'll move. move. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear who moved. Can someone say that again? Tom Sussman moved. Tom Sussman, thank you for the motion. Uh, vision recommendation number one. Uh, do I have a second? This is Patricia West, I second. Thank you, Patricia. All those in favor of passing Vision Recommendation 1 as proposed on the screen in front of you, uh, please say aye. 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 Okay. Anyone opposed to Vision Recommendation number 1, please say nay. Uh, any abstentions? I, I'll continue to abstain. Thank you. Uh, I will also abstain for this one based on my comments earlier. So, Kirsten, do you want to read out the vote on this one? So we're all clear. Sure. The uh, visit recommendation number one passes um, with two abstentions, Alina Sino and Bobby Talabian. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Moving right along. So the next uh, vision recommendation number two Kirsten, you're going to turn the slide, right? Uh, I believe we're going to have Patricia West and Suzanne Piotrowski presenting on uh, 2A, 2B, and 2C. And I'm going to turn it over to Patricia and Suzanne. I don't know who wants to go first, but the floor is all yours. Sure. Uh, good morning. This is Patricia West from NLRB. Um, the the first part of our recommendation, um, this is regarding raising the priority of FOIA, and this is uh, obtaining support from leadership. And I'll just read the recommendation. It's the Archivist of the United States proposes 
that the Chief FOIA Officer's Council recommend that agency leadership annually issue a memo reminding the workforce of its responsibilities and obligations under the FOIA and encouraging the workforce to contact the agency's FOIA officer for assistance with the FOIA process. And uh, the goal here um, was um, that if the agency leadership um, sends out this memo uh, to the employees, it, it really highlights the importance of FOIA throughout the agency. And just a, a little bit of background information on um, how, how we came up with this recommendation. Um, back in 2013, uh, OGIS uh, provided for this recommendation um, and they had recommended that agency leadership actively support FOIA programs and encourage the issuance of memos by their senior officials. And uh, they made this recommendation, but, but not only that, they led by example in that the archivist sent this memo around agency-wide. Um, during that time, 2013, uh, to my knowledge, two other agencies followed suit, uh, and that was Department of Transportation and Department of Energy. And I was at Department of Energy when the Secretary issued this memo, and I can tell you um, it really assisted the FOIA program there greatly, whereas before, um, my colleagues did not realize that we were limited and that we only had 20 working days to turn around a FOIA request um, or that when we needed a consultation with them, again, that we, we had a limited time constraint. And just this simple memo going around um, really helped the uh, employees become more engaged and realize that FOIA is everyone's responsibility. Um, since that time, I was at, at two other agencies, including my current one, uh, where this memo has been issued by leadership. And, and I can tell it does um, engage employees, and it, it just shows that, that the leaders at the agencies um, support the program. So, uh, our thought in having the Chief FOIA Officers Council recommend this is because uh, those are the folks at, at the agencies who can really um, obtain the leadership buy-in into sending such a memo. So we thought that that would be uh, the best, the best group of folks to make that recommendation, and, and I think by doing that, um, it will really, uh, really make it much easier for those types of memos to be, to be coming down. Uh, our goal is that it would be sent out annually, but um, uh, so uh, there you have it. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments regarding this recommendation? Very quiet, Patricia. Does everyone have their coffee wow. this morning? I just want to make sure we're all awake. Okay. This is Bobby. Go ahead, Bobby. I was just going to say these are the previous one and this one are great recommendations, which is probably why people aren't commenting as much. Yeah, and Alina, this is Chris Knox at Deloitte. We, we, you know, on the on the Vision Subcommittee, we've we've talked about this these uh, recommendations extensively, so I wouldn't expect to hear much from the, the Vision Subcommittee. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, any other comments? This is Michael. Uh, Michael from Michael Morrissey from Muckrock. Uh, I just love the fact that I, mean, I think this is something that doesn't cost a lot of money. This isn't something that, um, you know, doesn't require big programmatic shifts, but it is something that has had demonstrated success in the past. And I think we have really seen that the messaging from the top matters. And I, I, 
I think this is just a great recommendation. A lot of thought went into that. Um, you know, I think this is something where FOIA is, is a team sport, and I think we don't often enough recognize that it's it's it really requires the full team playing on, and I, I think this helps with that. I'd love to coin that expression, Michael. Can I? FOIA is a team sport? That's great. I love that. Have it. Have it. Especially because you can't have any team sports right now. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we get, can we get some baseball caps made? Yes. Along with FOIA is everyone's responsibility. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, it sounds like I'm seeing shaking of heads no. No more comments. It sounds like we're ready to vote on this recommendation 2A of the Vision Subcommittee. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, uh, to pass this recommendation? I move to um, uh, pass this recommendation. Okay, Patricia. Patricia do I have a second from anyone? Sure. This is Suzanne Piotrowski. I move to second. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. All those in favor of Vision Recommendation 2A, as it is displayed on your screen currently, please uh, say aye. Aye. Uh, Okay, not sure I heard everyone. Hopefully, Kirsten, did you get everyone? Is there anyone who's opposed? Please say nay. Okay, I didn't hear any nays. Uh, is anyone abstaining? Hi, it's Bobby, abstaining. And Alina Simo, abstaining. So, Kirsten, can you read us out? Yes, um, vision recommendation 2A passes 17 to 0. There are two abstentions, Alina and Bobby. Thank you very much. Okay, we're doing a great job, guys. Um, moving right along to vision recommendation 2B, I believe Patricia and Suzanne, you guys still have the floor. So please, by all means, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, this one was mine. This is Suzanne Piotrowski from Rutgers. I won't read you the recommendation since everybody has it on the screen and probably has it in front of them as well. But um, the title is um, FOIA and Administrative Transitions. The gist of it is um, trying to figure out ways um, to brief senior leadership after transitions or other times of leadership change. The rationale is that there is um, a lot of good um, uh, training right now for FOIA officers or staff dealing with FOIA, but not there's not a formal training or briefing for senior leadership. And this is um, the intention of this recommendation to to make um, briefings for senior leaders when they come in, either during transitions or other times. I think that's it. And um, this is this is uh, Patricia West. Um, one of the things that um, Susanna and I thought was that to have that um, OGIS and OIP work together to to prepare these briefings for the for the different federal agencies uh, would really carry weight with the agencies in that it's not just, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one particular agency's briefing. I think when new leadership comes in and they hear that this type of training was created by OGIS and, and, and OIP, um, that, you know, they'll, it, it will really, um, they'll really take note of it, I believe. Thank you for that, Patricia. And this is uh, Sean Moulton uh, with uh, Project and Government Oversight. Um, I think this dovetails, uh, as, as Michael just said, about the uh, previous recommendation about FOIA being a a team sport and the importance of leadership, um, I think what this really recognizes is it's going to be really important for leadership to even understand uh, 
FOIA and when we have these big transitions, um, that can that can be one of the things that as a new team comes in, they've got a lot on their plate. Uh, I think this one can get lost for a long time, um, and uh, and that that can be a real problem. So I, I think that's that's what this is trying to address, and I think it does it well. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. Any other comments or reactions? Uh-oh. Emily, are you trying to speak? Not here, Emily. Did you unmute? Alina, this is Ryan Law. Um, I just wanted, this is, I, I like this recommendation. I think it's incredibly important um, for all the reasons that uh, our, our fellow panel members have mentioned. Um, I know that DOJ had five years ago, Melanie did a, a great quick 10 minute briefing done by video um, that I know the Treasury utilized during the transition. Um, I, I think I think that worked well. Uh, we may, um, want to ensure that that's updated um, as well. Um, and then also, I think we could find other opportunities to provide that training too. But I think this recommendation is great, um, and uh, I think the committee should pass it. This is, this is Bobby. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that's actually uh, partly what I had thought about for this recommendation too, so to update that video. Okay, um, I think Emily is trying to talk to us as opposed to her being on another call, but we cannot hear her, right? Can anyone else hear her? No. Emily, if you have um, something that you could chat to all of us, even though it violates my role of no housekeeping, uh, of anything other than housekeeping rather, we could read it out loud. Uh, Alina, this is Chris Knox. There was a note in the chat that uh, most of the lines were muted and you need to hit star six to unmute. Yeah. Emily, that might be yeah. the issue. Yeah, Lauren, um, our event producer, chatted all that to us, and I just chatted that to Emily as well. So if, you're, if you can press star six, that would be great. If I'm misreading any of Emily's cues, then please ignore me. Okay, uh, in the meantime, anyone else want to chime in on anything with regard to recommendation to be from the vision subcommittee? Sounds like there's positive support. Okay. All right. Um, so are we ready to vote on it? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, do I have a motion from someone to I move? Recommendation 2B of the Vision Subcommittee. I, I move to, to vote on Recommendation 2B. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Do I have a second? Second. Tom, thank you for the second. Okay, all those in favor of passing Vision Recommendation 2B as it appears on the screen, uh, please say aye. 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 All those uh, opposed, please say nay. Hear any nays? Uh, any abstentions? This is Bobby, and I abstain. This is Alina Simo, and I also abstain. Kirsten, I'm just yeah. concerned about Emily not being able to to hear mm -hmm. to be able to chime in. Lauren, do you have any suggestions for Emily to, to make sure that it, her audio is working? I just want to be sure she's getting the opportunity to be heard and able to get her votes heard. Yeah. Emily, if you're able to, can you dial pound two on your telephone keypad? If you can hear us. Okay, it looks like Emily is on the attendee line, so I will just go ahead and unmute her. Okay, thank you. Is this Emily? Yeah, thank you, Emily. We can hear you. You're apparently on the attendee line. Okay. 
I'm unable to hear Emily. The other one? No, we can't hear you. Okay. I can't hear her either. Okay. Um. Um, so the line disconnected, uh, Emily might be trying to come in on the speaker line at this time. Okay, that would be great. Can we, um, everyone just bear with us for one second, give Emily a chance to catch up with us. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Now we've lost, no, not even lost it again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I'm so sorry. Sorry about Hi, that. Hi, Emily. No, it's so okay. Sorry. Did you want to make a comment on recommendation 2B? Um, Ryan sort of addressed my question, which was I think I, I am not sure practically speaking how some of this training would be introduced, but it's, I think that he provided some insight for me, so I think my question was essentially answered. Okay. Um, so, and since I'm concerned that we couldn't hear you before, I just want to be sure that um, your vote on recommendation 2B is an aye or a nay. There you go. Does anyone else hear her? No. It was an aye. Can you hear me? Yes. And, uh, and just to be clear, for vision recommendation uh, 2A, were you also an I? Yes. Okay, so Emily, I've been an I. I. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I just want to be sure we're clear. Okay. And uh, Kirsten, now you can go ahead and report out the vote, please, for recommendation 2B. Yes, thank you. Um, recommendation, vision recommendation 2B passes with two abstentions, <laughs> Alina and Bobby. Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone, let's move along. How are we doing? Hang in there. Uh, okay, so recommendation to C of the Vision Subcommittee, um, again, turning it back to Patricia and Suzanne. I don't know who's going to present. Uh, this is Suzanne Piotrowski again. I'll, I'll kick it off and Patricia will jump in. Okay. Oh, you already got it up there. Thank you, Kirsten. So this is speaking about, um, speaking to the issue of FOIA and agency performance plans. This is a relatively new topic, it seems, for the group as a whole. So the recommendation as currently written is relatively broad to give um, um, OGIS and OIP a little bit of room to, to think this through. Um, again, in the same way that the prior one was asking for um, sort of a team between OGIS and OIP, this one is also. And uh, this one is um, directing OGIS and requesting OIP examine the um, FOIA performance measures and agency performance plan. Um, just as sort of like a little side note, these are, these are not individual, um, individual employees performance evaluations. We're talking about performance plans of agencies as a whole. Uh, and what, uh, and then, sorry, and then the next step would be, um, actually, it's, I'm reading here now, it says the subcommittee further recommends, I, yeah, I guess that's right, that um, OGIS would submit the results of an assessment of how FOIA is used in performance plans to Congress and the President. And the rationale behind this is generally um, you get what you measure, right? So if we're including performance, FOIA performance, in at least more of the agency plans, maybe, hopefully, there's more likely to be, uh, there's more attention that will be given to FOIA um, processes. Uh, Patricia, do you, you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, yes. Well, I will add this. Um, 
I remember our first meeting, and uh, Suzanne uh, made a comment about the lack of FOIA performance measures in the various agencies' plans. And uh, it never even dawned on me that uh, that they would not be incorporated in an agency plan. So I, I remember this, you know, from our first full committee meeting, and I just thought it was such a brilliant uh, idea. I, I did go back to the office that day, and I, I checked my agency to see if, <laughs> if we had measures in our, our performance plan, and I'm, I'm happy to say we did, but I think it's, it's – um, it's really something that can help agents, that can help FOIA programs at the various agencies and and also um, add in to have that leadership support because once you have the support of leadership, I mean, it's everything for a FOIA program. Okay, Patricia, thank you so much. Can I just chime in, Suzanne and Patricia? Do we want to change in the second sentence from subcommittee to committee? Any nods? Yes. Not in? No, yes. Um, okay. but yes. Um, I think so. The, the reason why uh, we had subcommittee there was just that this is division subcommittee recommending, but, but yes, you're right. It, uh, it should be the, the full committee. If, yes. If passed. <laughs> right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I guess we would change it to committee now, and then if it's passed, it, it goes in as a committee. Right. Is, is everyone good with that? With that tweak? Okay, I'm seeing that one. Okay. Um, anyone else want to comment or chime in on this recommendation? Uh, Elena, this is Chris Knox. Actually, a question about the working group. As they compile these, um, are they rolling them all up as a committee recommendation so that any language that might have sat at the subcommittee is 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 rising up as the, as we vote on them and approve them? That's the committee recommending it. I would assume the the working group is doing that. So I'm pausing for a second. Sean and Jason and Patricia and Avi, can you guys help me out with this? I, I'm exactly how to answer that. I, so I didn't quite like hear the question. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I, I, I think uh, so. The question was, um, are we uh, fixing things uh, if we come across them in the drafting committee? Um, if if they, we have a language problem like this, where the subcommittee's there. Are we making it all from the committee? And I think uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, I think we feel the freedom to do it in the body, um, but when it comes to the uh, uh, formal, bolded recommendation language, we haven't really been changing anything. Uh, and if we think about doing it or have discussions about that, the, the idea has been to go back to the, uh, come back to the full committee to get approval for anything. And I agree with that approach. I just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Patricia, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, no. But I, I think for, for this particular recommendation, we can all agree that that we're, we're changing subcommittee to committee so that when we, uh, when it is indeed passed, we'll have the, the correct language. Okay. I see Tom Sutton raising his hand. Yes, uh, make sure I'm, you can hear me out here. Yes. Um, I was, uh, uh, I, when I first read just the recommendation, if the recommendation is pulled out from any explanation, it doesn't really tell us why they're examining the performance measures and what the assessment mm -hmm. and recommendations address. Uh, the, the, the discussion language is, you know, suggests the goal of ensuring agencies include and performance plans. I think that ought to be lifted up into the recommendation because otherwise, examine, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, we'll examine the measures. 
and then we report, but what are we, mm -hmm. assessing? you know, why are we assessing it? What are we assessing? So it doesn't really stand on its own. And so I think it just was some slight, maybe the drafting committee even could, could, could make some slight uh, additions to show what's going to be, uh, why it's being examined and what kind of uh, criteria mm -hmm. assessments will be based on. Patricia and Suzanne, do you want to react to that? I, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. If it would be clearer by adding additional language or moving language up, then um, I, I think we should do that. Tom, do you have a particular suggestion for a language you're thinking of when you're reading this and it feels like something's missing? No, I just... Uh... I mean, maybe just taking the language from the goal statement in the report, uh, in the discussion, that says should examine for your perform performance measures used in the agency performance plans and records to ensure that agencies include FOIA in their performance plans. And then the mm -hmm. committee recommendation of the assessment, and, you know, that's the assessment is whether they're including it. I guess the assessment, I, I, I leave to maybe Patricia's, should the assessment be qualitative or simply at this point a determination that uh, that it's uh, FOIA is included? Well, I think um, I appreciate your notes, Tom, and I think that the, the first and kind of foremost, most important uh, aspect is that the that they even address FOIA in this in this in their agency performance plans because from Suzanne's research, um, there were a great number of agencies that didn't even mention FOIA in their plans. So I think that's the first step. That you make um, a great point about um, you know about putting in maybe. Some, some language, taking some some portions of the rationale below and incorporating that up, up top. And that's something Suzanne and I can work on. Elaine, that's Jason. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, one uh, simple possible fix is to say that the Archives of the U.S. directs their OGIS and requests that the OJOIP examine whether FOIA performance measures are used in agency performance plans and reports, with the presumption being that they should be. Uh, okay. Yes, Jason, although I hear Tom wanting to add to that sentence and to ensure that FOIA performance measures are included in agency performance plans and reports. Well, yes. I mean, if you need that as a motion, I'll be glad to do it, and I will certainly defer to Patricia's notion that step that that's step one, and that we don't need to get into any kind of uh, qualitative uh, uh, standards for assessments here. Uh, Tom, and this is Suzanne here, and as you know, you know better than me. Different agencies have different relationships with FOIA, right? So, how NARA would include FOIA and their performance plan would be different than than another agency. So um, we just would want to um, make sure we recognize that reality, and I think this this would, your, um, your additions would. Okay. I'll take yes for an answer. <laughs> Are you comfortable with the addition that I cited earlier? If we add the clause and to ensure FOIA performance measures are included in agency performance plans and reports, works for me. Yeah, uh, okay. Alina, this is Patricia. Can you can you say that again? And to ensure that agency and to ensure that agency FOIA performance measures are included in agency performance plans and reports. Okay.
and then we would um, uh, insert the word weather uh, after examine per, per Jason's suggestion, correct? Not necessarily. I like mine is simpler, but, uh, um, and I, I understand the point. Whatever, whatever the wording is, that's fine. Uh, This is Sean from uh, POGO. Um, I'm wondering if, if we make that change of uh, ensure that FOIA performance measures are used in their agency performance plans and reports, do we even need to request that we examine? I mean, examine if they're used and ensure they're used. If we're saying, OGIS and OIP should ensure that they're used. Uh, I would assume that that would entail an examination uh, and then other steps. Well, it it, it uh, is in some tension with the second sentence then, which is mm -hmm. yes, recommending that some results of some assessment be made rather than a direction to do something. That was Jason Barron, for the record. Yes, it was. I mean, I think if we, if we take Tom's recommendation to strengthen the first uh, sentence uh, and and go from examine to ensure to to make it a recommendation that these this proactively be done uh, is our recommendation, then it it. it negates the need for uh, at submitting the results of the assessment and recommendations to Congress, um, although we could change that to say, um, you know, uh, it would be a lot of words missing right now, but um, the committee further recommends that uh, uh, if uh, agencies are found not to be using them, uh, then any uh, recommendations be submitted to Congress and the President, et cetera. But, uh, so we could still include a sentence there. Uh, I and mean, like I said, it's a lot of wordsmithing right now, but. This is Joan. Um, I, I like the idea of making it more proactive um, or the, the direction to do something, but I think that it would simplify things by striking the second sentence if, um, if we did make that change to the, the first part. Um, that, that would be my, my preference, because I do think that it gets complicated if OGIS is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, providing recommendations to Congress and the President, um, it, would it be, you know, reporting on the agencies that have failed to do this? Um, and then I think we would have to dig down into what uh, OGIS can report to Congress and the President under H5. Um, it, it's possible that we they could do that. They could make a report of, you know, agencies' failure to do something, but I think it would require a little bit of research. This is this is Bobby for um, I I uh, I'm a bit more in favor of the examine with the goal being to ensure that the FOIA is in their performance plans, um, simply just to give us flexibility, not knowing how much we can impact an agency's overall performance plan um, or where that would come from. But it clearly states that the overall goal of the work that we would be doing is to ensure agencies are including in their plans. Yeah, this is Alina. I just want to comment that certainly wearing my hat as the OGIS director, we have uh, not uh, felt as though we have any particular constraints about what kinds of recommendations we can take to Congress. I think they're very open to hearing from us. Um, and uh, I think there's some other legislative recommendations later on we're going to discuss as well, which adds to our plate. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm agnostic, and I was actually, of course, going to abstain from this recommendation as well in terms of how you guys both, you know, best want to proceed with all of this. Kirsten is prepared to read Wordsmith's language if we want to go in that direction. Uh, the other option is we table recommendation 2C until our next and final meeting and have it Wordsmith 
uh, circulated, and then we vote on the final language at the next meeting. And I'm going to look to Patricia and Suzanne and Joan and Chris as to how you guys want to proceed. Um, so this is Patricia West from NLRB. Um, I, and I appreciate everyone's comments and feedback. That's very helpful. Um, the, the reason why we drafted it as we did was, was one, we wanted to see uh, how many agencies were addressing the FOIA program in their agency plans. Um, and then to have OGIS submit a report to Congress on it with recommendations, um, we felt that that would carry some weight with the agencies and, and that uh, it would, they, they would then consider um, putting FOIA performance measures in their plans. Um, the one concern I have about adding the language, um, the D saying examine and ensure that agencies um, that uh, uh, performances are included in the plans, is to say and to ensure um, is that something that OGIS and DOJ can do right now? Um, because I, I don't know that there has been, to my knowledge, a recommendation by OGIS or by OIP to I include FOIA performance measures in a plan. So that was, that's the reason why we drafted it the way we did. Uh, this is Suzanne Piotrowski again. I would, I, I'm agreeing with everything Patricia says, and um, and maybe we knew, do need to wordsmith this some more because it is getting a little complicated. Um, I also am not so sure, and sure feels very strong, and I'm not so sure OGIS can do that. Maybe encourage, you know, uh, report and encourage agencies to include perform, uh, FOIA in their performance plans or facilitate or something along that line. And I think the idea with some type of reporting out was a bit of the um, naming and shaming, right? So you have a report which says which agencies are and are not including it, and maybe that would uh, facilitate or encourage agencies to include. Um, so uh, um, it's up to the group. Or, um, Joan or Chris, how did you want to handle it? I, I think uh, maybe if to... Patricia West, can I just also say something else? I think someone had suggested that we remove that second portion of the recommendation um, where the committee recommends OGIS submit the results of its assessment to Congress. I think that um, really needs to stay in because OGIS it would be the, the, the proper group to make uh, such an assessment. And I, I think, again, this, you know, if, if if OGIS is, is doing an assessment of this, I think that will um, encourage agencies to, to take this uh, to take this suggestion seriously. This is Joan. Uh, the suggestion to remove the second sentence is only if we change the first um, move away from an examination. I agree that if if it remains as an examination, uh, there's a real benefit to including the reporting, the recommendation. Um, I agree with Suzanne that uh, we might end up losing some clarity um, if we continue to, you know, verbally discuss what the language would look like. And I think that there's a benefit for seeing, um, I, uh, you know, an alt any suggested altered language via email or something like that. That would be my suggestion. Okay, so uh, Chris, do you want to weigh in as coaching? I was just going to say, I, I, I agree with Joan as well. Okay. It sounds to me like the consensus is we want to work with some work between now and the next meeting, and we're going to table this recommendation to see and not vote on it today. Is that correct? Okay. I'm um, Alina, this, this is Patricia. Uh, um, yes. Yeah. 
similar to what we did with time volume, um, may I suggest that we vote on the spirit of this recommendation? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, okay. Knowing that we're still playing around with the language and we need to firm up whether um, we add language to the first sentence, whether the second sentence stays in or comes out, et cetera. Um, is everyone prepared to vote on the spirit of the recommendation? Sort of seeing mostly yeses. Thank you, James Jacobs. Um, okay, so can I have a motion in favor of voting on the spirit of recommendation 2C from the Vision Subcommittee? I so move. All right, thank you, Patricia. Do I have a second? Second. I second. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I, I think it was Jason who second. All right, so um, let's next all vote. All in favor of moving for the in spirit recommendation 2C of the Vision Subcommittee, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say nay. Nay again. Did I hear any nays? Uh, any abstentions? This is Bobby, and I abstain. Alina Simo, I also abstain. Okay, Trish, can you read out that vote, please? Yes. Um, vision recommendation to see in spirit um, was passed with two abstentions, Alina and Bobby. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's keep moving. And I want to go on to Vision Recommendation 3. Uh, it's got three parts to it, uh, A, B, and C as well. And I understand Sean Mason from Pogo is going to present on this. So, Sean, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and I welcome all the committee members to the controversial portion of our meeting. Um, so, one of the uh, ideas here uh, was to come up with a series of recommendations for uh, legislative action or congressional action, I should say, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, bills per se, but um, and there has been some discussion, which I won't uh, go over here. Uh, I'm sure we'll go over as we finalize the report, but um, ways that uh, and if this subcommittee or this committee can make recommendations uh, directed at Congress, and I, I think we have enough uh, wiggle room is the final consensus is that we can craft something um, uh, if, if that's the committee's choice. So uh, I've structured these three um, in uh, ascending order of controversy. Uh, and the first one uh, that you'll see uh, on the slide in front of you is uh, about strengthening uh, oversight. Uh, this is both congressional action uh, with hearings, uh, more regular hearings, more regular communications uh, and information collection with uh, agencies uh, rather than the maybe once a year hearing we get on FOIA uh, right now, right around Sunshine Week. Uh, but then also to, uh, as you'll see at the end, strengthen uh, the Office of Government Information Services uh, with clear authority and expanded resources. Um, and uh, the language uh, supporting this uh, explains that they've done uh, terrific work since being uh, uh, founded, uh, but that they're a very small office trying to uh, assist uh, with FOIA across uh, the entire federal government, and they uh, they need uh, greater resources and clear authority uh, for when interacting with uh, other agencies. And so I will pause there for this first recommendation and open it to discussion. So this is James Stoker. Um, I, I just want to, um, you know, applaud the, the spirit of this uh, of this recommendation. I think uh, it's extremely important that Congress play a stronger role in the oversight of the Freedom of Information Act, and it's good to, uh, you know, issue a clear call for the Congress to do so. I think it would be nice to see more specifics in this recommendation. I know the Vision Subcommittee. Uh, I think I saw its job maybe, and you can tell me if I'm right, as coming up with a very broad vision rather than as, as specifics here. But I think that there would be a lot of different areas in, in which um, this could be, could be made more clear. You know, one example that comes to mind is determining 
uh, which part of Congress is in charge of FOIA? And uh, I, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that there are any committees within Congress that specifically have FOIA or transparency as, as their subject or their domain in the way that uh, they might have, say, foreign affairs or homeland security or, uh, you know, immigration or, or combating illegal drugs or, or, or whatever else. And so, uh, maybe one way to, I don't want to say put teeth into this, but to, um, you know, to focus the measure would be to ask Congress to identify particular agencies that would be in charge of the issue. I'm not sure whether that would fit within this uh, particular recommendation or not. Maybe that's something that needs to be done in a future session of this uh, committee, maybe in the next term. But uh, it, it just would be helpful to have more specifics here for the Congress to latch on to. Thank you. Tom? Can I raise my hand? Uh, yeah, yeah for, uh, for, for at least 50 something years, the committees in the House and Senate with jurisdiction over FOIA have remained the same and constant. They may have changed names of subcommittees or in the House the committee name, but uh, I don't think there's any mistaking who has jurisdiction. The question of again, what this addresses, of course, is they, they don't do anything about it. Uh, once a year, usually when there's sunshine week, there's a hearing, sometimes oversight. Uh, but so I think it's so I think it's useful to encourage Congress to do more because that's always extremely helpful. So this is this is Kevin. I hope you can hear me, Kevin Goldberg. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is, and it would be a slight tweak, uh, but after the word regular, had and coordinated. Because this picks up on what Tom was just saying. You tend to have one a year, maybe if you're lucky, twice a year hearings. And what often happens is, in the interest of time, you know, an agency official, and I'm not picking on you, Bobby, but usually uh, your office is called up to testify, ask a bunch of questions, the answers are given, and then there's no follow-up to that specific to see what has happened since. There's just a new set of problems a year later that we're dealing with. <laughs> and that's what I mean coordinated. Uh, if there's a better way we can phrase that, that is kind of the issue, because it doesn't always have to be hearings, there just has to be follow-up to make sure that things are, are occurring as, as promised. Kevin, just to clarify, which regular did you want to add that word to? Is it the first regular or the second regular? Sorry, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I would put it in the, <laughs> I didn't even notice that. I was so, lit, like, hyper-focused on the, set, the second sentence. I would say we encourage Congress to hold more hearings, establish a more regular and coordinated stream of communication and inquiries to agencies around FOIA issues, and, you know, take it from there. And that's fine. I, I agree. This is Sean from Pogo. I, I think Kevin raises a good point that it's, the oversight we have seen uh, comes across as disjointed uh, from yeah. It's a great word, Sean. Now I have to step away from my computer, but not out of the room for a second. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, any other any comments other? or feedback on this? Sorry, Sean. That's exactly what I was going to ask, so that's fine. Okay, are we ready to vote on this recommendation? Nod, yes, okay. So um, are we in agreement we're gonna add the words and coordinated in the second sentence after the word regular and before screen? So, so yeah, we're all clear yeah. on what we're voting on, recommendation 3A of Vision Subcommittee. Uh, the second sentence would read, we encourage Congress to do more hearings, establish a more regular and coordinated stream of communication, and the rest goes on the same way it is, okay? So can I have a motion? Sorry, this is James, Jacob. James and Ryan. Yes. I had a question. James, James yes. Um, were we going to add the specific committee as per James Stoker's comment? Or is that not necessary? Just a question. <laughs> Good question. Sean, what do you want to do? So, um, and I don't, Ryan, did you want to speak on this? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm just making sure I hold my place in line. Okay. Uh, so, so as to James's uh, uh, point, uh, I, I tend to agree with Tom that uh, I feel like uh, there, 
from con Congress's point of view, it is pretty set, uh, you know, which committees in the House and Senate, uh, you know, have jurisdiction over FOIA. Um, I mean, I think we could make cases that um, uh, issue committees, like environmental committees, might uh, get involved more. Uh, certainly, we could see an expansion if uh, an agency like EPA or an agency like Interior or, you know, not to call any, any agency out here, but I'm just saying that the uh, committees with jurisdiction over those agencies could also get a little involved in FOIA, which I would be fine with. But I think the, the real oversight of FOIA as a, as a system and process, I, I do feel, uh, is, is pretty established. Maybe just as a, as a further on recommendation, just putting it into the, the rationale to describe that yeah. so that the public would know um, which committees of Congress yeah. do have jurisdiction over over FOIA. Okay. I think that would be very helpful. I could I could certainly add uh, in, into the text uh, as we uh, move it into the if it gets approved, move it into the uh, uh, full report, and everyone can be able to see it. Um, but yeah, happy Thank you. to do that. Thank you, James. Jacob's James Stoker, does that make you happier? Yes, I, I think that's fine. I mean, I think that there are different ways that this could, could be taken further. You know, I think if it's for, if, if this is an issue that is just seen as sort of a small part of one committee's uh, duties, that may be why they're not paying as much attention to it. So perhaps Congress could, could rethink the way that it uh, you know, organizes or names the committees. If it's a committee on, you know, oversight and reform or something that's dealing with the FOIA, maybe it could be oversight and reform and transparency. But I, if the authors of this recommendation don't feel the need to take this any further, then I'm not going to, to push for it. Ryan, did you raise your hand earlier? I did. I right. Yes, and I'm sorry for the late question. Um, so this is Ryan Law. So, just to be clear, are we as the committee requesting directly to Congress that they take this action, or are we requesting that the Archivist of the United States request that Congress or recommend that Congress? Who, who's doing the action here? Uh, so my understanding, and as I said, we, we had some uh, uh, subgroup had some discussions as to how we might handle this. Um, and what we're going to try and do is craft uh, in the introduction of the full report um, some language that explains these recommendations uh, that follow, all of them are being delivered to the archivist, uh, and that any recommendations that require action by someone uh, outside of the National Archives, uh, we fully expect the archivist to convey them uh, to those uh, those parties or those entities. Uh, and that way we don't have to, uh, and I try to avoid the, we recommend the National Archivist convey to Congress. So that's why it's saying we recommend Congress right now um, and uh, because I just thought it would read simpler. But these are still gonna be delivered to the Archivist um, and the idea is, and hopefully maybe we'll be able to streamline some of the language with the other ones by moving that, these are all being delivered to the archivist to the very front of the report. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we vote on 3A? Yeah, hi, this is Lizette. I mean, hi, Lizette. Uh, yeah, just uh, um, kind of following up in, in that same vein of um, maybe providing a little more uh, specificity for the portion of the recommendation that says um, long-standing problems. Um, I, I'm just curious, I, I was looking at the other material we received. I, are we talking about one uh, specific problem or kind of a, a several? I, I just didn't know. Um, you know, what we were discussing here or what this was referring to. Um, it, it, so I, I drafted it and uh, you raised a good point that I, I didn't even, um, I was definitely talking about multiple problems. Um, okay. 
and I didn't really uh, illuminate uh, with any any detail, but I'm I'm happy to include uh, some of the uh, larger problems or or the longer standing problems, the delays, uh, increasing backlogs, uh, uh, problems with with resources, uh, updating regulations. I mean, there's uh, there's a good number that we could uh, we could list, but um, okay, yeah, that that's helpful. Okay, so Sean, you can add that to the rationale section. Yes, I can and will. Yeah. You have the rationale sentence. The first paragraph starts with the fact that given the difficulty of the responsibilities laid on employer, rising volume of register plus challenges agency could long face. So maybe the spelling out more of the challenges would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. I agree. So, okay. Thank you for that for that comment. That's very helpful. Okay. okay. Anyone else before we vote? Right. Uh, do I have a motion to vote on recommendation 3A division subcommittee with the words and coordinated added in the second sentence after regular and before stream as proposed by Kevin Bolton. I'll move for them. Okay. This is for the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. This is Kevin. All right. Thank you, Kevin. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. There any nays? Uh, abstentions. This is Bobby. I abstain. And this is Alina Simo. I also abstain. Okay. Sean, you have your work cut out for you on 3A. Do you want to take us to 3B so we can keep the momentum going? And I'm just going to check in with everyone. Before you get to 3B, usually around this time we take a break. Uh, Sean, how quickly do you think you could get through 3B and 3C? Um, it's a it's a fair question. Um, I do think that there uh, I'm fine with keeping conversation um, limited. My expectation is that uh, 3C will be something, and we've discussed this in great detail on our subcommittee. It's something that will probably have to be uh, moved over to or held over to another term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. It's a rather substantive one, but I did want to at least have some discussion for this term. Um, I think we could get through um, uh, the two of them uh, by noon, uh, maybe sooner, but um, just okay. throwing that out there. And I did want to say... I did want to say, do we want to have uh, Kirsten report in on the voting? Yeah. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn to Kirsten. Kirsten, thank you. Please report on vision recommendation 3A. Yes, thank you. Um, vision recommendation 3A passes with the language agreed upon with two abstentions, Alina and Bobby. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. All right, so Sean, do you want to present on 3D? Sure. Uh, 3D is, uh, I, I tried to keep the language simple. I'm actually going to read it just because uh, uh, we recommend Congress directly address the issue of funding for FOIA offices and ensure that agencies receive and commit sufficient uh, dedicated resources to meet their legal obligations to respond to FOIA requests in a timely manner both today and in the future. Um, we did not, as you'll, you know, if you've read through the um, uh, supporting uh, text, we did not say exactly how Congress should do this. Uh, I actually raised the idea of a, a budget line item for FOIA uh, in the future or also report language, but neither are, are specifically recommended to be pursued. But the idea was uh, behind this idea, the, the idea behind this budget recommendation was Congress gave the agencies this responsibility. Um, Congress controls uh, broadly the, the purse, spring, purse strings of government, uh, and they should make sure that, uh, you know, the resources are, are brought to bear. Um, obviously, agencies have the potential to solve the resources problem, and we have some recommendations for that. But I also think Congress could weigh in uh, and, and should weigh in on this. So I open it up for discussion. Okay. 
Okay. I don't hear anyone piping in. Does everyone want, uh, just want to get to our break? Is that what's going on here? Uh, anyone want to comment on this? This is Joan Kaminer, ETA. Um, I would just note that in the time volume um, training one, we do have a request for, um, you know, budget funding resources. Uh, I, I fully support this recommendation, and I think that goes along with it. It's way as expensive, and we probably could be more effective um, with more resources. John? Anyone else? This is Ryan uh, Law. Um, one, and, and this may be something the subcommittee committed, uh, considered, excuse me. Um, the Congress does set agency budgets, um, and it sometimes is very specific on how agencies spend those, those tax dollars. Um, but uh, the document that guides uh, well, of course, the president's budget, uh, which is uh, agencies develop uh, circular A108 is the document that's put out by OMB every year. I checked quickly. There were six references to the word FOIA in it. They all dealt with how information regarding the disclosure of the budget would be handled. And so not a really scientific evaluation of the content of A11, but it seems that um, you know, I, I think this recommendation is great, but another way to crack the nut might be to um, request that OMB include in A11 specific instructions to agencies to include in their agency submissions for their annual budgets funding uh, sufficient for FOIA operations. I'll put that out there for consideration, uh, and I'd like to hear if the subcommittee considered that. Uh, I, I did not, uh, I mean, I, I, I included a reference in the supporting text uh, saying that maybe we include a line item, and that is in part a reference to the fact that it is, it's not included in any agency's uh, budget right now, a specific broken out line item uh, for Congress to even consider. Um, I, I still would uh, probably, my, my personal preference is to, to approach this from Congress. Um, rather than to, to try and come through OMB, but um, I, I do think that that's a, a potential uh, point where if we got a line item for, from agencies, that alone would be a real victory. Thank you. I think that's that's good. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Suggested language. Do you think we're ready to vote on this recommendation? Like we are. Um, may I, and there's no language crafting that we've done here, so as is, does, uh, does anyone um, have a motion they would like to make? Or have yeah, this is Ryan. This is Ryan. I'll move to vote. Thank you, Ryan. Do I have a second? This is James. I'll second. Thank you, James. All those in favor, Thanks, Jacob. say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please say nay. Uh, any abstentions? This is Bobby, abstain. Nina, Simo, abstain. Okay, Kirsten, can you report out, please? Yes, vision recommendation 3B is passed with two abstentions, Alina and Bobby. Thank you very much. Sean, you're on a roll. Uh, over to you for recommendation 3C. Where that roll will immediately stop. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the um, uh, certainly the most controversial one. We've had uh, a lot of back and forth in our subcommittee, um, which was so much fun that I thought I would bring it to the full committee. Um, <laughs> the uh, And if we could advance the slide, I don't know if I can do that. Nope, I cannot. Oh, there we go. So the uh, the concept behind this was uh, expanding, uh, in some way, the uh, stat the FOIA statute so that there would be requirements uh, to both uh, bodies in the uh, federal legislative and judicial branches to accept 
uh, and uh, a requirement that they respond to requests for information, that there be laid out uh, the idea of exemptions, excluded records, uh, that all this be uh, appealable and judicially reviewable, that, that, it's, that the essential principles of FOIA uh, be applied in so, to, to some bodies. Again, you know, we can play around with it. Um, but to the judicial and legislative branches. Right now, there's a lot of information that comes out uh, from both those branches, which is uh, obviously very good. Uh, but for the most part, there's no legal requirement uh, that that information uh, be available. Uh, that a lot of that information could change, uh, and there'd be no legal recourse for people if suddenly uh, a committee started to, you know, operate behind closed doors and we didn't agree with it. Um, if uh, a particular member stopped posting certain information on their website or, or to their constituents. Uh, and so um, one of the things you may see in the um, uh, supporting text uh, that I, I wanted to point out is that uh, a, a large number of states uh, do include some portion of their legislative and judicial branches uh, in their open records laws and require requests. Sometimes those are limited to administrative records only, how they're spending money, things like that. Uh, but they, they do uh, have those branches covered. Uh, and I, I, I think that we can craft, and this may not be it, but we can craft a way to uh, have uh, similar requirements uh, for those two branches. Um, and I will uh, leave that open to conversation. I think Tom and Kevin uh, my uh, my foils in the subcommittee will probably step up first and uh, give a counter argument. I'm ready to. <laughs> I am too. Ready to be you, Tom. You're going to say it better. I know it. All right, Tom, Tom Sussman. Let's let's start by saying we'd have to reconsider recommendation three A because I think it would be very awkward to have to have oversight on its own. Uh, uh, activities in this area, but I, I thought that, that the, the last comment was really good because the, the, the way this reads, non, it really is looking at um, non-FOIA statutory requirements for more transparency. Uh, the recommendation recognizes uh, that uh, expand FOIA law to include new statutory requirements. And I think if you look at the states, as, as was mentioned, uh, the states and other countries that have adopted right information laws for the legislature, many of them are crafted specifically for the legislature. And uh, we are, after all, a free advisory committee, so I'm not sure that uh, we ought to be going there. But frankly, uh, we need to, I think we need to look at history. Going you know, back to 1965, I've told the tale many times about how um, the uh, members of the House uh, asked Don Moss whether Congress was included before uh, they would do this. And this is one of the few statutes that uh, does specifically exclude Congress. Uh, I don't know if the subcommittee uh, looked at I don't believe so, but through the years there have been legislative proposals and hearings uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, on proposals to defend OSHA, um, you know, labor laws, uh, equal employment laws, and look at the Congress. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of good material in there, uh, I think, suggesting that it's not necessarily a good idea. Uh, and, uh, and finally, I think, you know, we have to look at the un potential the consequences, I would say unintended consequences uh, in those jurisdictions that do apply for you to the legislature. Um, a few that I've looked at, the, the legislatures are mighty hostile to um, transparency and FOIA because they have to comply. And I don't think that's a, a, a good um, place to be. Um, Congress has always been very supportive of transparency of the executive branch. Uh, and, uh, and I think I'd hate to lose that congressional support, oversight, and strengthening the FOIA from time to time uh, just because we think that Congress ought to be more transparent. Um, I wouldn't mind, you know, looking more specifically at Congress and what's public and not public. 
I think that the issue of uh, more administrative transparency and budget transparency for the courts is absolutely useful. I'm just not sure that that's our uh, uh, our uh, bailiwick for this committee. So that's all I have to say. Well, and and that's a great time, place for me to pick up, Tom. This is Kevin because I I have less of a problem with the legislative side than the judicial side of things. And my problem is that while not perfect, I don't I do think there are many. I do think that the right of access to judicial records, that is case records, is not impeded by things that would be fixed under this recommendation. Um, there are kind of, cat, not categories, but, but there are standards for covered and excluded records. There are ideas of what's exempted for withholding a pretty well-created you know, well body or established body of law. There's the appeals process and the right to judicial review. And frankly, the standard is arguably higher for access to a judicial record and that it's constitutional rather than statutory. So I, I do see what you're saying about the budget and administrative records perhaps. And if we limited to that uh, in a FOIA-like process, I would, I would be more amenable, but I don't think we really have the time to, to parse that now. Um, you know, so, so, so what I'm saying is I don't see how this recommendation improves access to judicial records the only thing that I think everybody might be able to agree on and is easily stated is some kind of recommendation that we can't make that PACER be free, PACER access be free. So I think that's a really big impediment to, to people getting access to court records. This is James Stoker, if I can talk for a second. Uh, I, I just want to uh, applaud Sean and the committee for thinking very broadly about freedom of information. I, I do think that this is within the uh, the realm of this uh, this committee. Uh, we are to think about you know, freedom of information broadly, not necessarily how the Freedom of Information Act is currently structured. But it's acceptable for us to kind of push the limits of, uh, of what is being done right now. <laughs> That, that Tom and Kevin have raised really valid concerns here, and uh, I'm, I, I don't think that this recommendation, at least in my view, is, is, is something that I could, I could support because those recommendations are, 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 are very, oh, sorry, those uh, reservations are, are very valid. I, I'd encourage Sean and everybody else to think specifically about what the problem is that, that this recommendation is trying to solve. What are the specific types of documents or information that, that the public does not have access to right now and it needs access to. Uh, uh, so uh, Kevin, for instance, mentioned uh, a variety of ways in which uh, access to judicial documents is already possible. What, what are we not getting that, uh, that we need access to? If there is really something that is not available now, either from the legislature or from the judicial branch, maybe there is a, a way to, uh, to, to modify the FOIA or to come up with some new set of rules uh, that we could recommend. Um, and I'd love to see that in a future uh, term of this, this committee. So thanks, uh, for, thanks this, for your work on this. This is Lee, I have a comment. I'm sorry, Lee, go ahead. I know Jason also wants to type in, but Lee, go ahead. Yeah, so just responding to the last comment, uh, right now, uh, First of all, I, I'm in favor of this one, at least uh, maybe uh, maybe modified, but I'm in favor of this recommendation. But for instance, uh, a lot of the agency uh, records are excluded from FOIA simply, be, simply by virtue of the fact that they're designated a congressional record. So if, if for instance, the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation uh, uh, writes to the IRS for, for some documents, the the uh, even if those documents are agency documents in the in the first instance, the, the JCT is now set, is is now making a claim that those documents have become congressional records and, and therefore have been taken out of the FOIA. So the, the very I, I I do think there is an issue with legislative documents, congressional documents that uh, the, the agencies and Congress use the exemptions in, in existing FOIA law to actually uh, reach out and, and, and take uh, certain records that would otherwise be available under FOIA now and, and take them out, out of, the, out of the, uh, the FOIA context. And so 
uh, th that type of thing I think is problematic, at least from the requester side of things. And um, a, 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 uh, an amendment to FOIA that expanded to congressional records, uh, or at least certain types of congressional records, would actually be a help, in my view. Thanks, Jason. I know you wanted to chime in. Uh, this is Jason Barrett. You can hear me, Elena? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I uh, applaud the, uh, the sort of the visionary aspect of this, like it's been said, and, and uh, it's certainly within the scope of our advisory committee to be um, uh, discussing uh, this recommendation. I, my initial reaction was that it was a complete non-starter with respect to the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, and so we do need to think through whether we would want to ever put this before Congress, because I have a feeling that it would, uh, in its current form, it would uh, undermine the good work that we're trying to do on the other legislative proposals and um, all the proposals generally. However, um, in taking a second look at the recommendation, what I, I do want to say is that I have always found it anomalous that the definition of what a federal record is or really what a federal agency is, is different for federal record keeping purposes than uh, for FOIA. And if one looks at 44 U.S.C. 2901, uh, subpart 14, the definition of a federal agency is any executive agency or any establishment of the legislative and judicial branch of the government, except for the Supreme Court, the Senate, the House, and the architect of the Capitol, um, and with that in mind, uh, there is something to be said for further consideration, maybe during the next term of this committee or otherwise, um, to crafting a proposal that attempts to harmonize uh, the FOIA with the, the Federal Records Act in a way that would allow for other legislative entities that exist uh, like the Government Accountability Office or the Library of Congress or whatever uh, as being within the scope of the FOIA um, rather than out. And that is to make consistent FOIA and federal record keeping. And so I, I think there's merit in having uh, further conversations um, all around, and I would very much support uh, this proposal being uh, essentially uh, sent over a table for now, but sent over to the next advisory committee to have a, a very full vetting where you'd have speakers come in and have a full discussion and maybe iron out the nuances. Jason, appreciate that. Anyone else want to comment? Uh, this is Suzanne. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Suzanne. Okay. Um, uh, in general, I'm also supportive of the big picture take um, and this committee having the ability to look big picture and I'm also um, acknowledging <coughs> that it seems to be um, premature to vote or to pass on this now, but maybe we could get to this later, but I'm looking at the outline that the subgroup is working on and I didn't know if it was possible to make suggestions for possible topics for the next committee. Um, I don't think we, um, you could let me know, but I don't think we can find the hands of the next federal advisory committee, but possibly we could offer topics for them to consider just so we could have it on the record somehow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's always possible. We can certainly include that in the and the final report, I think that makes a lot of sense. How does the working group feel about that generally? Uh, yeah, I, uh, this is Sean. I, I, we haven't, uh, none of the previous terms have done that, but there's, there's certainly another, nothing that prevents them uh, from, from doing that, uh, as, as certainly as part of the report. But as Suzanne said, the next term uh, and its committee members would have the freedom to say, it choose to pick something else to work on and say if they think it's more fruitful or more important than whatever this term uh, suggested. Okay. 
So I'm hearing general sentiment that um, we overall want to push this back uh, and table a vote on this, Sean. Is that what you're hearing? Yes, it's a, I acknowledge that it's a very thorny issue, um, and, and even some of the stuff that uh, has been raised here uh, by, by Tom and Kevin, uh, you know, some of it's new, and uh, I, I agree it's worth considering carefully, and um, I think Jason made a good uh, uh, pitch for, um, you know, if the next term decides to explore this area, you know, they would have more time to unpack it, bring in speakers, figure out if there's some way to break it down into smaller compartments, maybe the administrative records, maybe this uh, alignment with the Federal Records Act uh, are ways we could chip away at, at some of this um, in a more uh, acceptable way that doesn't have some of the unintended consequences, I think, that have been uh, raised that we, I think we all agree we would want to avoid. So. I'm fine with okay. withdrawing it for now. Okay. All right. And do you have concurrence from Chris and Joan, your subcommittee co-chairs? Yes, I concur. This is Joan. Okay. Chris, you're good. I do as well. Not of course. Shaking head. Okay. So um, I, we have one more vision uh, subcommittee recommendation we want to go through. It's vision recommendation number four. Uh, Jason is going to present to us on that, but I think we're all ready for grace. So I would like to propose we take a, is it possible to take a 10 minute break as opposed to 15 minutes? How do, how do folks feel about that? I'm seeing nods. So can we all agree to come back here at 12, 12 p.m.? That would be great. Uh, and just a reminder, make sure you turn off your volume and turn off your camera if you don't want everyone to see what's going on in each one of your homes during our break. So let's take a break for the time being and we will return at 12, 12 p.m. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you.
still have a lot to cover. And uh, Jason Barron is going to present on Vision Recommendation 4, which is literally very visionary. And I'm going to turn the floor over to him if everyone is ready. Okay, thanks, Selena. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, recommendation says that the archivists of the U.S. should continue to take a leadership role in ensuring that ongoing and future federal data strategies incorporate existing FOIA access and federal record keeping policies. The word continue is there purposely the way that I drafted it because uh, Archivist David Ferriero has been taking a leadership role um, ever since uh, he came into office, but uh, certainly after the Managing Government Records Directive of 2012 and the 2019 memorandum that sets a 2022 deadline for agencies managing their records electronically, um, there's a lot that's been happening. Uh, however, uh, in my experience and the experience of others, uh, the uh, elements of FOIA and federal record keeping are not necessarily uh, always front and center considered when other parts of this administration and other administrations are talking about open government and federal data strategies. And so the, the focus here is to make sure that the archivist has an opportunity to play an important role in reminding members of the open government and the federal data strategy communities that a substantial amount of data and information created or used by federal agencies also satisfies the definition of, of what constitutes agency records under FOIA and federal records under the Federal Records Act. There's always a challenge for NARA being at, at the table, having a seat at the table in high-level policy-making discussions, uh, including those about federal data. But I think it is important for the archivist to continue taking a leadership role in highly, highlighting the issues involved in managing and providing access to government records in the form of data because the data will, as we all know, will exponentially grow over time. Um, and it's being created throughout uh, the executive branch in every way possible. And so this is uh, a marker for this committee to say that the archivist should continue what he has been doing and uh, make sure in every opportunity um, uh, bring up the the, uh, the subjects of FOIA and record keeping when federal data is being discussed. Okay. Jason, thank you very much for that. Uh, anyone want to comment on this or share your thoughts or ha ask questions about this? And, and Jason, just so I'm clear, is it your intent that this is Another one of the recommendations that would fall in the rubric of things that we're trying to pass forward to the next committee? Uh, no, I actually had a different conception in mind. I never consider this to necessarily be a formal recommendation. I know for purposes here, uh, there was some consensus of the vision subcommittee to put it forth like that for a vote. Um, my original conception was to have it as the uh, part of a last section of our final report, uh, which would say a look to the future and wouldn't necessarily be a formal recommendation, but it would be what this committee is uh, stating to the world as what uh, we think is appropriate. If everyone thought that it could be a recommendation, we could put it in as such, uh, but it's not something, uh, it's something for us to do here uh, to put in our final report. So just to be clear, you don't necessarily want everyone to vote on it as a committee. Well, I, that's where the vision, since it, since it has been uh, put forward as part of a vision set of recommendations, there's no, I have no problem. I, I certainly, uh, uh, you all could consider it to be part of our votes today and to give it a thumbs up. Um, I'm not sure it necessarily has to be uh, in the form of a recommendation, but that's up to everyone else. Okay. Can I hear from other folks who have a reaction to that? Uh, James Jacobs has raised his hand very politely. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jason, for, for putting this forward. I, uh, I fully support um, 
support this and wonder how you're going to uh, to jive this with with uh, the records management uh, recommendation number nine, which talks about machine readable um, information and, and FOIA records. Well, I uh, there are uh, several recommendations that we had as a subcommittee that that do tie into this. That's one, and and uh, and and certainly the one that we passed as a committee of the whole is uh, uh, on chief data officers being liaisons to the greater CDO community also ties in uh, given recent legislation. I think this is a standing alone. It's a it's a step up uh, from any of our other recommendations as a subcommittee. It's just a, a sort of a general statement uh, for the archivist to take forward in everything that NARA is involved with and, uh, and you know, should be considered as such. I fully agree. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, this is Tom Sussman. I like it as a recommendation, actually. I mean, a recommend, you know, we're making recommendations to the archivist, and this is, you know, it's general and high level, but it's still our view. Okay. Yeah, this is Sean um, from Pogo. Uh, we discussed it. Uh, Jason, as you mentioned, came up with it kind of uh, later in the process, but we discussed it in the vision subcommittee, and I, I you know, it seemed to go over well there. Um, and I certainly thought of it as a recommendation. Um, if, if there's a reason not to put it as a recommendation, I'm, I'm amenable to it, but I don't see any reason we shouldn't just uh, keep it in the same structure. And Joan and Chris, you guys agree you were intending for it to be a recommendation we would vote on? Yeah, that, 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 yes, that, that was, that was yeah. at least my intent. Sorry, Susan. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like we want to vote on it. Do I have anyone else? Anyone else want to chime in? Any other comments? I just want to make sure we've heard from everyone that wants to weigh in. It's like the nods, everyone's weighed in. Okay. Can I have a motion to move this vision recommendation number four forward? I'll, I'll move, Tom Sussman. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second, James okay, Jacobs. Thanks. Seconding. All right. All those in favor of recommendation four for vision subcommittee, please say aye. 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 Uh, for the record, James Jacobs raised his hand. He didn't say aye, but I think he that was an aye. I did say uh, aye. Yeah, but anyone? I, okay. Uh, anyone opposed? <laughs> please say nay. Are there any nays? Any abstentions? Bobby and I'm saying. Yeah, this is Alina. I think I'm also going to abstain, and so I think it will fall into OGIS to ensure the archivist is continuing in this role, so I abstain. Um, but Kirsten, you want to read us out? Yes. Um, vision recommendation number four has passed. Um, Bobby and Alina are abstaining, and I'll note that um, Sarah Kotler had to leave the meeting. Yes. She has not returned, although she is. Oh, and, and at least her camera mode is going on, but I have not heard too much. So. Um, okay, I would like to ask everyone to turn their attention back to Vision Recommendation 2C. Um, uh, Suzanne and Patricia had an opportunity to work with a little bit, and they were eager to try to get it back in front of everyone today to see whether we could pass it uh, with amended language. Uh, Patricia circulated it to everyone. Kirsten is about to chat it to all attendees, which also means I believe that all participants will be able to see it. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, yep. I, I see it now. Okay, I see it too. Uh, Kirsten, I see that you send it to all panelists. Can you also send it to all attendees or you did that separately? She's giving me a thumbs up. I just want to make sure all attendees are seeing it. Um, Patricia and Suzanne, do you want to address anything, or do you think it speaks for itself? Uh, well, I can just, uh, this is Patricia Webb from NLRB. I can just uh, point out that the changes. Um, Suzanne was good enough to tweak it. Um, uh, 
basically uh, in the first sentence, um, we added uh, the language to encourage agencies to include uh, FOIA in their performance plan. In the second sentence, we changed uh, the word subcommittee to committee. And I think uh, the, the changes here incorporate a lot of the suggestions that we received earlier. And I didn't want, I wanted to, um, yeah, with these changes, my, my goal was the hope that we could, I know we voted on it, that it passed in spirit, but I'd like to uh, vote again uh, to, to see that the language is approved um, just so that we can, can have this done by the end of, of this meeting. So, Patricia, do you want to move? I um, move to vote on this recommendation with the revised language. Can I ask a question? This is Tom. Tom, yes, Tom. Tom. Do you, is it intended that OGIS and OIP jointly uh, do this uh, uh, examination or independently? Uh, so the way that we uh, the way that we drafted it is is that OGIS would review the the actual information and make the assessment. Um, our hope that was that uh, OIP could assist them in the process. Okay. Um, this is Alina, and uh, Bobby, perhaps you could chime in as well. I think I view this as a collaborative effort uh, between main OGIS and OIP. Yeah, this is Bobby, and I, we, we talked a little bit about it. Um, I think there's something, I appreciate the, the, the flexibility there and how we're going to accomplish this, but uh, something that we're looking forward to working with OGIS with. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I think we're ready to take a vote. I have a motion. I have a second. Uh, all those in favor of passing the amended language as displayed on your chat function or in your email, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Bobby abstaining. And Alina Simo abstaining. Okay, Kirsten, can you read us out on 2C, please? Sure. Vision recommended 2C as amended. The language is in the chat box and via email to um, to committee members. Passes Bobby and Alina abstaining. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep moving. Uh, and I actually, I think we're ready to go to time value recommendation. And I know Kirsten in the PowerPoint slide deck had included recommendation one, but I, I believe we have consensus that it is going to become a best practice. So I think we could skip over that slide with everyone's permission and uh, flip over to recommendation two for time volume. And I believe this would have been presented by Bradley, but Emily is graciously agreeing to step in uh, as the oh. chair to talk to us a little bit about two. Oh, hi. It's uh, Lena. This is Patricia West. Um, I, I think, uh, Emily, did you want me to talk about this? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Patricia, over to you. Yeah. Um, so um, we had voted on this at our last committee meeting, and it, and it passed in spirit, um, but there were some great comments and, and suggestions, so we, we revised the language um, in accordance with that, and, and that's what you see on your screen here right now. Um, the, the reason, the rationale for drafting this was um, two, two things. Um, it came from the survey that we conducted, 
And we found that a good deal of requesters did not have an understanding of the FOIA process. And so we felt that uh, the agencies could, could do better with, uh, in drafting an SOP as well as beefing up their FOIA webpage. Um, also from the results of the survey, it came back that many FOIA professionals wish to have an SOP. Uh, so, so that's uh, how the, how this recommendation um, came to be. And if anyone has any questions on the new language, I'm I'm happy to discuss it, or if you have any other suggestions. Any comments, questions? Meeting fatigue. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think we're ready to move on the language, uh, unless I hear any other objections. Can I have a motion on the proposed language for recommendation two for time volume subcommittee? I, I so move. Tisha, do I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, let's all vote. All in favor of recommendation two as written, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Bobby abstaining. <laughs> Uh, Kirsten, you can mark me down as an eye on that. I'm not abstaining from this one. Melina. Okay. The recommendation time volume two passes um, with one abstention, and that is Bobby. Okay. Thanks, Selena. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patricia. Okay, I'm uh, moving right along. Time volume recommendation three, I believe it is Joan. Joan, you're going to present on this? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so we discussed this recommendation at our last meeting, um, but as a result of that conversation and subsequent conversations, we made a few revisions. Um, it's a little long, so I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but I'm going to highlight um, that we are, one, uh, requesting that guidance is issued for annual mandatory FOIA training for all agency employees, um, and that includes onboarding and, where applicable, program-specific training. In addition, um, and this is the portion that you we discussed at the last meeting, um, we're directing, uh, recommending that uh, the archivist direct OGIS and request OIP to undertake the study of agency's current FOIA training. Um, and that would encompass beyond the annual training, but may include um, evaluation of uh, varying agency requirements for mandatory training, onboarding supplemental, first-line supervisor training, and program-specific training for subject matter experts and technology um, professionals. And lastly, um, we are requesting OGIS ask Congress to support this recommendation by providing appropriations for agency FOIA training costs acknowledging that uh, training is and um, is very important, but also it can be a, a strain on resources um, and can be very expensive. Um, so by showing support through appropriations for training, we believe we can, you know, further the goals of the committee as a whole, but also this individual recommendation. I can answer any questions or if anybody has any comments. John, thank you. This is Alina. I actually um, had a question about the bracket. Um, do you want to propose a recommendation? Do you want the study may include that, that bracketed portion to be part of the recommendation? Yes, I thought that was just an accidental holdover with the main uh, sentence bracketed, the study may include. Um, and I personally would like to include that. The second section with bracket, which is a line item, um, is up for discussion on whether or not we wanted to, I mean, it's all up for discussion, um, whether or not it should be recommendation by providing appropriations or specifically a line item appropriation. 
Well, I could, it's Jason Barrett, I could weigh in. I'm responsible for the brackets um, and in, in uh, making my suggestions to the committee, the subcommittee. Um, the, uh, the reason for the first set of brackets is simply because I have, as a general rule, I, I think for drafting purposes we should make these recommendations pithy and, and as short as possible and, and confined to one sentence. And so it could, that material could be moved to a, uh, the text of whatever uh, final report we do. And as for the line item, yes, that was up for further conversation. This is Tom Sussman. Can I talk? Yes, please. Um, I, I would uh, delete the uh, line item reference. Uh, I just, I think it's kind of dangerous because then you know, if Congress doesn't provide a line item, then the agency says, well, you know, that's why we're not doing training. Uh, and that, that, that just, that's, that goes back to the earlier discussion about providing resources. I didn't mention at the time, here, but I think it's really important to be careful about uh, being so specific about how Congress and agencies direct resources in the FOIA area, because uh, this is not likely to feel it's worth its while to single out uh, line items for training in FOIA, and then when it doesn't, the agency says, oh, well, we tried, uh, let's wait much before our training starts. So I just, uh, I would suggest deleting that. Joan, any reaction to that? I have no concerns with deleting the line item. I think that's um, a very legitimate concern with including it. Does anyone want to speak uh, on whether to include it or not? Anyone else other than Tom? This is Suzanne. I think we should exclude it. I was going to say the same thing. Kevin, thank you. All right. This is Ryan. Uh, this, this is Ryan. I think it might make sense to, uh, of course, move it to the narrative below, um, you know, uh, as opposed to including the recommendation. Okay. So it sounds like general consensus we're going to not include the bracketed line item, kind of what I'm hearing. What about the uh, earlier sentence that Jason is fully responsible for, or partially responsible for? Uh, what is the sentiment on that? Should we move that to the rationale section of the report? Or do we leave it in the recommendation? One went away in, one way or the other. Is everyone agnostic? Joan, <laughs> as long as it's included, um, in the, the underlying um, explanation, um, I think it's important to key because I think it lists some varying areas of training that might not be considered and I think are important to acknowledge. Um, but I understand the need to keep the actual recommendation succinct. Um, so as long as we're confirming that we're keeping that language, even if it's in the, um, the section below, I have no concerns with that. Yes, Joan, just to clarify, I was proposing that we would take that bracketed language and put it in the rationale um, section that would follow this particular recommendation. That was what Jason was recommending. Anyone else feel one way or the other about this? I feel like I've got Joan. James Jacobs. Yes. This is yes, James please. Jacobs. I, I would agree to just move it into the, uh, into the explanatory part. Okay. In the interest of this. Okay. From Ryan and Jay Stoker, okay. I, I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Michael, you're good? Good. Okay, this is Patricia. So, I, I agree yeah. it should be moved to the rationale. Okay, it seems like that's the consensus. So what I would vote, uh, propose that we vote on rather, is we vote on the language as is before us without the bracketed information and an agreement that the sentence that's bracketed in full be put in rationale along with um, a line item discussion, if you will, uh, and the value of a line item uh, in the rationale as well. Does that sound 
Uh, good to you, Joan. Okay. So, um, can I have a motion to vote on recommendation number three for time volume? This is Joan. I motion agree. to vote. Okay. I, I have two motions to vote um, from James Schoper and, and Joan. Can I have a second? This is Patricia. Second. I second the motion. Patricia. Thank you. And James Jacobs is also seconded. So everyone seconded. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Aye. Is there a nay? Okay, I didn't hear an nay. Anyone abstaining? I abstain. Uh, Alina Simo abstains. Kirsten, would you mind reading us up, please? Sure, so time volume recommendation number three um, passes with the first bracketed language moved to the explanatory text and the second bracketed um, text removed. The uh, passes with just two abstentions, Alina and Bobby. And thank you very much. So I think we're ready to move on to time rec volume recommendation number four. I believe James Stoker is going to present to us. And again, I think what we're trying to do here, James, you'll talk about this, I'm sure, but we're just trying to ensure clarification that the committee knows exactly what language we're voting on, correct? That's correct. This is James Stoker. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Elena. Okay. So uh, time, time volume uh, subcommittee's recommendation number four um, had its uh, language changed a little bit at the last meeting. As a result of concerns that the recommendation would be too burdensome for, for some agencies to implement in a very timely manner. Uh, the current language reads as follows. Recommend that the archivist request that OGIS and OIP request that agencies identify common categories of documents requested frequently under the FOIA and or Privacy Act by or on behalf of individuals seeking records about themselves and seek to establish alternative processes for providing access to these documents to requesters in a more efficient manner than the FOIA. The goal of this recommendation, as, uh, as everyone will recall, is to help ensure that the Freedom of Information Act is meeting its original legislative intent of enhancing the transparency of government operations for the public. Currently, as we know, many FOIA requests are for information to be used by an individual, say information about their tax records or information about uh, their immigration file. And while these are important goals uh, that require uh, the government to produce information and documents, they don't necessarily serve the original legislative intent of the FOIA of enhancing government transparency. And so this can uh, distort a little bit uh, our understanding of what the FOIA is doing. So annual FOIA reports, for instance, although they show a, a steady increase in the number of FOIA requests, may not actually reflect whether or not the government is becoming more transparent. So the hope is that this recommendation will uh, encourage agencies to establish alternative ways of getting access to this, uh, this information, whether through online portals or uh, through uh, separate request processes. Uh, and that this will result in, uh, in Freedom of Information Act operations that more uh, closely uh, reflect that original legislative intent. So it's my hope that, uh, that the changes that were made in this recommendation are so satisfactory uh, to everyone that they've met all concerns, but I'd be glad to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Have any questions, comments, ideas, thoughts? Okay, this might be an easy one for all of us. Uh, so can I have a motion? Uh, to go ahead and vote on time volume recommendation number four. Lena, this is Ryan. I'll motion to vote. Thank you. Do I have a second? This is Sean. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I'll take the second. All those in favor of time volume recommendation number four, as James has just read it, uh, please say aye. 
Uh, I think I heard everyone say aye. Uh, anyone say, uh, anyone is against this recommendation, please say nay. Okay, I didn't hear any nays. Uh, any abstentions? I abstain. Okay, Bobby's abstaining and Alina Sino is abstaining. Okay, this is Kirsten. Um, time volume recommendation four passes with Bobby and Alina abstaining. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, James. And we're now moving on to time volume recommendation number five. Kirsten has flipped our slides for us, and I believe this is Abby who is presenting on this. Yeah. Yes, this is Abby. Um, so we, we went over this recommendation in our last meeting, and the one comment I got, um, I think from Jason Barron, was that um, in Part B, it wasn't entirely accurate that it was consistent with the um, M1921. So I changed that language to um, state in support of uh, National Archives and Records Administration's M1921 memorandum. Um, and then also deleted um, an extra that in Part B. But uh, the purpose of Recommendation 5 is really to encourage people to, or agencies to provide information that should already be made available, but perhaps is not online, um, to put that online so that people can readily access it and not resort to the FOIA. That's it in a nutshell. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Anyone mm -hmm. have any questions, comments? Michael, you were just stretching, right? That wasn't a, I wanted to raise my hand to say something. Okay, just checking. Correct. All right, I'm not hearing anyone jump up. So mm -hmm. this one perhaps is also not terribly controversial. Um, anyone else just going once, going twice? Anyone else want to say anything? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to pass recommendation number five from Time and Volume Subcommittee? So moved. Okay, Tom Sussman is moving for recommendation number five. Can I have a second? This is Abby. I second. Thank you, Abby. Uh, all those in favor of passing time volume recommendation number five, please say aye. 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 Uh, again, aye. recommendation number five, please say nay. Are any abstentions? I abstain. Yeah, Alina Simo abstains as well, along with Bobby Palladium. Okay, this is Kirsten. Time volume recommendation five passes with Bobby and Alina abstaining. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for the time volume subcommittee. Emily, thank you very much. Um, so, I have um, anyone else have any thoughts at this point, or can we move on to the last part of our agenda? I thought I heard someone want to chime in with something. No? Okay. So we, before we get to the public comment section of our meeting, I thought it would be great if we could spend a few minutes discussing the working group's proposed outline for the final report. By popular vote, I believe we have nominated Sean Moulton to discuss the outline, and uh, but the rest of the working group can take questions and uh, address any concerns. So Sean, can I turn it over to you? Yes. Um, uh, I'm not sure there was a vote, so much as a, a Shanghai, but um, uh, it's uh, been a, a terrific group to work uh, with, so I'm, I'm happy to present uh, the outline. And I will say uh, there's a lot of work underneath the outline that we've uh, really already tried to accomplish. We just, with a lot of the recommendations still not finalized, we didn't want to give you a Swiss cheese kind of product where there was just a lot of big gaps. Uh, so we thought the outline really uh, does stand alone. Um, we've taken some of the, uh, the early structure um, from the previous terms report, the idea, executive summary, um, introduction, 
uh, things like that, um, and are adapting that language. And then what we did is we tried to uh, group the recommendations rather than by subcommittee, uh, by the audience uh, to whom the recommendations are directed. Um, uh, we did at first try to put them into uh, buckets around themes and things like that, but uh, which we tried to maintain, as you'll see, color-coded um, uh, in here as well. Um, but uh, it seemed to flow better from our perspective uh, by grouping everything together that uh, OGIS and OIP would first do. Obviously, they're our biggest uh, uh, audience, uh, but then also to the agencies, uh, Chief FOIA Officers Council, there's one for SIGI, and then the possibility of recommendations of Congress, and we have approved uh, two there. Um, and we haven't uh, also, I should say, wrestled with the merger of all the recommendations yet, because again, we had some that hadn't been uh, fully approved, and so I do think there'll be some work on that in the future. Um, so just because they're listed here uh, in the outline doesn't necessarily mean they'll all remain separate. There is that possibility that some of them overlap enough that we, we may put them together. Um, and then finally, it finishes up, as you see, with uh, some uh, sort of basic stuff, uh, the methodology from the subcommittees, which I believe have all been drafted, um, committee members, things like that, appendices, uh, which uh, is pretty standard stuff now. Uh, happy to take any questions. We would also love to get everyone's reactions to all of this. Do you think this is a smart way to bucket things, if you will? Um, or would you have done it another, another way? Because if you would have done it another way, you should have been on the working group. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're happy to take the best one. Uh, this is Suzanne uh, Petrovsky. I, I think substantively it makes Makes sense to me. Great, thank you. I appreciate yep, the that's good. Jason, do you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no. Okay, Patricia. No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, Abby, anything to add? No, I don't have anything to add. All right. We either have meeting fatigue or everyone just loves our presentation of the order that we want to put the report in. So I'm going to take it as a positive sign, though. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, concept that I floated by the working group yesterday that I'm just going to put out there, I can't tell you that it's 100% a field deal, but it is certainly my intent. And um, the direction I want to move towards is once we do have a draft pulled together, uh, we would like, we, the working group, would like to uh, put it up on GitHub. And that way we can honor the spirit and the content of the FOIA, uh, sorry, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the FACA, uh, and it would allow both the committee members and members of the public to uh, provide comments. And uh, hopefully that will very smoothly. Our goal is to try to get it up there by the middle of May. I believe that's what we tentatively discussed. Don't hold me to that, but that's certainly what we're aiming for. So that would give us, uh, all of us in the, on the committee, approximately two weeks to review and comment. And, uh, and of course, it can be a fight. And we'll be happy to listen to uh, any comments we would get from the public as well. So um, how does that sound to everyone? Oh, um, also, I will, uh, Kirsten and I will be working on some kind of cheat sheet. Um, to help those those of you who have never been on GitHub before. I know enough about it to make me dangerous. Uh, I do have an account, though, so I feel like I'm making some progress. Um, it is not exactly the most intuitive uh, tool to use, but once you get on there and you start navigating, I think it, it becomes a little more understandable. So hopefully we can all manage that, and um, we'll be happy to try to help folks individually on the committee who are having problems technically. So. Uh, I, I'll put that promise out there. We do have um, 
someone at the National Archives who actually knows a lot about GitHub, so if we run into technical issues, we can reach out to that person. Okay. This uh, is Jane. Thank you, else? Alina, for doing that. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, anything else before we wrap up our business and we hear any public comments, either through chat or on the phone? Everyone, most people are shaking their heads no. No one's raising their hand. Okay. Um, so, at this time, I would like to turn to members of the public for any comments. So, for the next 15 or so minutes, we'll be happy to take comments from those of you who have uh, hopefully joined us and stayed with us for this entire committee meeting, either via uh, telephone or web. And Lauren, if I could turn it over to you just to give instructions again for how folks can uh, send their questions or comments. As a reminder, if you'd like to make a verbal comment over the phone, you may dial pound 2 on your telephone keypad to indicate that you wish to ask a question, and your line will be unmuted. If you wish to send in a uh, written comment, please uh, select all panelists in the Send To drop-down menu and uh, enter your chat in the message box provided. Uh, we do have a caller on the phone. Okay. Uh, if you could please uh, state your name and your affiliation, if it's appropriate. This is Michael Binder with the Air Force Declassification Office. We are not formally a FOIA organization, and therefore I am not permitted to speak on behalf of the Air Force. I am speaking as a member of the public. But based upon my experience, I've done FOIA review for about 14 years. Air Force is a very large organization. For example, during our biweekly FOIA teleconferences at the last one, we had 362 names on the distribution list. Now that's not all individual FOIA offices, but it does give you some idea the order of magnitude of how many FOIA offices we have. I exclusively look at classified documents, a lot of our FOIAs deal with classified information, Air Force, as well as other agency information. And one of the overriding conclusions I have from what I have seen today is that there's very little that has a positive impact on Air Force FOIA processing. I just wanted to throw that out. And I have a recommendation. There is a lot of talk about the application of technology. So we have been doing some work with the application of technology to FOIA review. There are other government organizations that do the same, and yet there is no way for the individual agencies to know what each other is doing because there is no central coordinating office. And if NARA is very eager for agencies to apply technology, it would seem to me incumbent upon NARA to serve the function of being that central coordinating office for that technology development. Hey, Michael, thank you very much for those comments. We really appreciate it. Anything else? You're good. We have no further comments on the phone. Turn it over to Jesse Kraft to see whether we have any chatted questions or comments. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. So we just had one chat earlier, so take us back to 10.46 a.m., and it's from Michael Heiss. And he says, good morning, everyone. Regarding Vision Recommendation 2A, is there a sample memo? And he apologizes if this was covered in a previous meeting. And that's the only comment. Thank you, Jesse. Um, this is Kirsten Mitchell, and I would say stay tuned to um, the OGIS blog um, and also to the final report and recommendations, which will be shared publicly, and we'll uh, be sure to reference that and, and get that language out there. Okay. 
Kirsten, thank you. Uh, Sean, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I uh, actually wanted to respond to uh, Michael Bender's uh, earlier comment uh, oh, and just sorry. say, I, I do think that um, the, the co coordination that, that Michael brought up is uh, something that, uh, you know, maybe isn't as uh, directly addressed as he might uh, like in these recommendations. But I, I do feel it was a theme in a lot of conversations that, um, and it's one of the reasons I think that we looked to the, for us, uh, on some of these subcommittees, I think it was the FOIA, uh, Chief FOIA Officers Council that we're hoping uh, to step in and play a bit of that role and centralizing and, and solving some of this. Um, and, and, you know, we'll have to see if, if, if they play that part uh, to sit our, our satisfaction. Um, and it's you know, certainly something to keep an eye on and, and weigh in again down the road. But uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. I believe Jason Barron would like to also make a comment in response to Michael Bender's comment. I just want to say that uh, while it wasn't covered in today's public meeting, we have uh, addressed technology in the records uh, management subcommittee uh, and the recommendations that were approved in the last public meeting. And so we're very cognizant as a committee as a whole that uh, there needs to be a step up in understanding what kinds of technology can be applied to FOIA. And so um, we, we are recommending in several ways that the archivist and OGIS and DOJ, OIT, encourage agencies to adopt uh, uh, new technologies that are available, especially in the discovery space, but also to look to the AI future. And so I'd recommend looking uh, to our final report uh, when it's in a form that uh, is publicly available for those kind of recommendations. Jason, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Jesse, back to you. Do we have any other chat questions or comments? Nope, that was it. All right, uh, any other callers that want to weigh in? We have no callers on the phone at this time. I think we've lost everyone to lunch. And if that's the case, I wouldn't necessarily blame them. Okay, uh, before we wrap up, any other last comments or items that we need to, to discuss or share with everyone while we're all together. This was a seriously okay. productive meeting. Thank you. I think. Tom, was that you? You said something? Yeah. Yeah, I just said it's a seriously productive meeting. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so I think we can all thank each other. We did a lot of great work today. We should all applaud ourselves. I want to invite everyone to visit our website um, and social media for more information about uh, everything that we're, we're doing. I want to remind everyone the next committee meeting and our final one, it's a little sad, it's been a great group of people, so I've really enjoyed working with everyone. It's going to be Thursday, not Friday, Thursday, June 4th at 10 a.m. Again, we're going to plug in virtually. Uh, please check our website for Eventbrite registration and. Um, note that we do try to close it a couple of days ahead of time so we can make sure we get RSCPs in and get link registration out to everyone. Um, and I want to thank it again to everyone for joining us today under these unprecedented circumstances. I, I hope that everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, resilient, and we will meet again in a month. Um, okay, any questions or concerns? Okay, no? Uh, all right. Well, then we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.